Welcome, Eagles, to a- another episode of Trad Cat Night Radio. I am Eric Kajewski, founder and owner of Trad Cat Night, the most viewed and followed traditional Catholic apostolate worldwide. This is also home to the new crusade. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I reported to you publicly on my social media about a week or so ago, I recently came in contact uh, with someone of high interest in regards to the world of tradition. And many of you were actually shocked when I had dropped the name. But I have with me uh, Bernard Jansen. And many of you will know him from his previous talks with uh, Father Malachi Martin, with uh, Bishop Williams. I'm going to go down a list here of people who, who he has interviewed. Michael Davies, uh, Father John O'Connor. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Charles Colium, Dr. David Allen White. Uh, also, Father Stephen Somerville, Father Peter Scott. The list goes on and on. Dr. Marion Horvat. And uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Mr. Jansen for coming on the radio show and just dropping all the knowledge on us in in relation to Father Malachi Martin, you know, his current take on the crisis in the church, Francis, we're going to get through a lot. This this one will be a blockbuster for sure on YouTube, but I want to make sure everyone is getting to his apostolate now because I, this is an apostolate that's being missed and sadly being missed, triumphcommunications.net. Okay, make sure you're getting there. The, the number is 306-567-3336. You have to get these CD recordings. You have to get his books and his videos. I know I learned a lot from listening to his talks with Father Malachi Martin and Bishop Williamson alone. Now, I'm hoping to have Bernard back on in the future to talk specifically about Bishop Williamson. Uh, but today, we're going to try to focus a little bit more on Father Malachi Martin and get into some other areas. But... Uh, without further ado, if I could uh, pass it over, but just a brief bio uh, for Mr. Jansen. Uh, you know, he's the owner of Triumph Communications, a publisher of Catholic books and recordings, a journalist who has interviewed, as we mentioned, a wide range of traditional Catholic authors. And we hope over the next two hours that you uh, learn a lot, uh, sit back and, and uh, be able to process the things that which we are saying, especially if you're, you're following Vatican II, following the Novus Ordo, and to really understand the times in which we live in, because it truly is a fight and, and battle for the faith. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Uh, Jansen. If there's anything that I left out, uh, Bernard, just, just throw it in there in terms of websites, books, and then opening question, I, I, I guess, uh, would be, you know, Father Malachi Martin and, you know, how you knew him, um, you know, maybe touch upon some of the talks. And then I, I think you made mention of a, of a movie coming out, a new movie coming out. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll hand it over to you now, sir, and I'll work off of you. Um, there is a new movie coming out later this year about uh, Father Malachi Martin. And I think that's indicative of the fact that there is an increased um, interest in the last year or two about uh, Malachi Martin. I've never had so many requests for interviews about Malachi Martin um, as I have this year. And I think that the reason is is because the message which was originally regarded as being a little bit off the wall is becoming more and more apparently real. In other words, things are playing out as uh, Malachi Martin had forecasts. And while talk about an apostasy in Rome seemed a little bit extreme during the pontificates maybe of uh, Pope John Paul II and uh, Pope Benedict, now under Pope Francis, um, this idea has entered the mainstream of uh, traditional Catholic thinking. Yeah, and so I'm I'm looking at this right now. You actually have a collective work, a, a box set, which you now can order on triumphcommunications.net. Um, please do go there and, and order this. Uh, I believe it's called The Wisdom of the Ages, and you have this broken down into, it seems, eight different categories based upon, I think, eight major talks that you had on YouTube. Is that correct? That is correct, actually. At the time, they were uh, sold as cassette tapes because the technology over the years has been changing. One reason that we put them in book format 
is to make sure they have been anchored down in a format which is going to last forever because um, cassette tapes, they've passed into history. It looks like we may be at kind of the end of the uh, CD era. And what to say that the technologies that are taking over now, which are primarily internet-based, will last forever. We don't know that. So we, I wanted to get them all uh, transcribed and sold as books, because I think books are the one technology that when uh, archaeologists, let's say, dig up the remains of our civilization 100 years from now, 500 years from now, they'll still be able to get the message from the books. I don't know what they will do with if they unearth a cassette tape or a CD recording. Yeah, and that's that's very well spoken. Many of us are are under uh, we're under the illusion that we could be under some type of EMP attack, even if electronics go down. I've been advocating make sure you have copies of, of Bibles and cyclicals. I know I printed them out, but you want to get things in print as opposed to computers and all these other technologies, because who knows what the world is going to look like after these chastisements. Um, but for those who are new, again, I get a lot of people, Bernard, even this past week, I spoke with three or four new ladies who are like, oh my goodness, I can't believe what's going on in the church. They, they, that, that red light finally went off in their head and they realized that we've been you know, taken over by these modernists and taken over by this uh, new religion, essentially is what it is, the cult of man, as Paul VI called it. And we're en route to that formal New Age religion in Rome. You know, talk, talk a little bit about how Father Martin kind of forewarned us of Catholicism basically being overturned. And then also, you know, the, the new mass that kind of goes along with this revolution. Well, uh, Father Martin was very knowledgeable about uh, what you could call the crisis in the church, the apostasy in the church, because he saw it coming. He was privy to uh, inside information that the rest of us um, didn't get to see. Uh, he was an assistant to Cardinal Bea in 1960. Um, Cardinal Bea read the third secret of Fatima, and Malachi Martin read the third secret of Fatima. Malachi Martin and anyone else who read the third secret of Fatima was not allowed to divulge what was in it word for word, but during the time of his work in the field of communications, Malachi Martin gave away enough that we know the basic content yeah. of the third secret of Fatima. And I'm sure that it would be no surprise to our listeners is that the content refers to the crisis in the church and the treachery of the uh, church's hierarchy because if it had been let's say something like forecast of nuclear wars why would Rome have kept it secret and uh, it is very interesting that Rome waited until Malachi Martin was dead before they released what they said was the third secret of Fatima because right. if um, Rome were to put out an incomplete or a false uh, third secret of Fatima, then Malachi Martin would have been released from his obligation to keep the content secret. And at that point, he could have uh, uh, given us the third secret word for word. So knowledge of the third secret of Fatima gave him inside information about the unfolding apostasy in the church, which sort of began uh, in 1960, when the mandate of Our Lady was that the secret was to have been revealed. And second source of information that uh, Malachi Martin had, that most of us mortals don't have, is contact w with uh, what you'd say the less, um, well, put it this way, the dark side of the supernatural, Malachi Martin was an exorcist, so the demons that he would come into contact with were a source of information. So he knew kind of the uh, agenda, the Luciferian agenda, before uh, it came out. For example, um, I'll give two examples actually. He knew 
about that homosexual marriage was to become a reality long before it actually uh, was enshrined right. in our legal system. And sometimes during his exorcisms, demons would say, why are you giving us a hard time? We are entrenched in the highest echelons in Rome. Yeah. So these were two sources of information that he had, which gave him kind of an inside uh, edge on knowing uh, where things were going to be headed. Absolutely. Now, was there any specific mention? I, I don't recall any recording, but a, any mention by the demons of, um, you know, the apostasy or the Second Vatican Council that you can think of? Um, again, going through many of your talks, if not all of your talks, I can't really remember one instance where that was. I mean, it's always implied, but no direct uh, comment uh, in relation to, you know, the Second Vatican Council as pushing people in a new direction, if you will. Well, in one case, um, he did mention during our interviews about um, the demons and the fact that they said that we are entrenched in the highest levels in Rome. So that, that is in those uh, interviews. And yes, it is implied in our uh, book, The Kingdom of Darkness, he did say that Satanists do not regard the... Um, new mass as a real mass wow. and so the horrible uh, parody of the mass that they do the black mass is always mirroring the traditional latin mass not the new mass which they regard as uh this bluff wow very interesting now what, what's your take uh we've covered a, a few points here um one point i'd like to get to is your take on the recent coming out of Benedict the 16th, whether he was forced to or not, and basically saying everything is revealed in the third secret. And, that, and you know, the whole traditional world blew up, whether it was my page, whether it was, you know, one Peter five or even father Paul Kramer coming out. I, I mean, what's going on? I mean, you know, obviously it, it's not been fully revealed even by Benedict the 16th's own uh, statements prior to, but relate to us what's really going on in Rome. I mean, are we in a situation where, only a major chastisement can really clean house. Well, the information was always there, actually. It's uh, only now that people are actually paying more attention to it. In the 1980s, uh, the then Cardinal Ratzinger uh, did a set of interviews, which was later released as the Ratzinger Report. And he did talk about, actually, the third secret of Fatima there, and that it can, it, uh, the content was about the... Uh, crisis in the church. Also, uh, astute observers noted that the original newspaper interviews were censored uh, in the book so that less was said about the third secret of Fatima in the book than what was originally the case in the newspaper interviews. And I think that's, that's true of a lot of things. Um, the information has always been there, but now as the conditions um, in Rome, in the world, the church are getting worse. People are paying more attention to it. Um, Malachi Martin was sort of regarded as a voice crying in the wilderness in the 1990s when he was trying to give up this information. And only now maybe are more people paying attention to it. Yeah, absolutely. Another hot topic that it's actually a video that I use quite often is Father Martin's take on Medjugorje in particular, but a lot of these false apparition websites that are that are popping up worldwide, and I can just tell you my opinion is, you know, they're using Our Lady, uh, the modernists, and eventually the New Age to further their doctrines and agenda, and they have technology now, ladies and gentlemen, where they can create holographic images in the sky. And there's one, there was one site in particular in Africa, which, which was debunked, that was a product of Project Bluebeam. But people have to be careful, as we know of Our Lady in La Salette, where she warned of there would be false prodigies everywhere because the true faith would be virtually non-existent. So we have to be careful of running to all the latest apparitions and, and, and the mystics talking on this or that. And that's why we, we just stick with, with Fatima here, essentially, not that you know, La Salette and Quito and, and, and Akita. Uh, might not be mentioned, but, you know, what what was, you know, his take on Medjugorje? Did he give you any further details on that? I mean, I know he was under the impression it wasn't, 
you know, of God. Well, talk about it. In our very first book, The Catholicism Overturned, he talks about apparitions extensively. Um, one of his takes on it is that the um, message of Fatima is central. And a lot of these other apparitions, let's say like Magigoria, are an attempt to de deflect kind of attention away from the key message of uh, Fatima. And he used the example of during D-Day, um, the Americans dropped some, let's say, dummy soldiers in various places, and the Germans wasted time uh, rounding these up rather than concentrating on the force that was invading. I, I think this is a tactic of the devil himself, because the devil works primarily through actually diversion. The devil can't always get people to do evil, but he can get them working on things which um, distract from the main message. And I think this is what is the case with um, apparitions like Magigori, is, is that they take attention away from Fatima, which is very critical because at Fatima, Our Lady gave uh, us a mandate, and this mandate isn't being carried out. And if uh, other apparitions are kind of crowding out um, the message of Fatima, yeah. well, then there's more chance that this mandate won't be carried out. Great point, Bernard. That's something we've talked about here. Yes, distraction. Move people away from the central message of Fatima. And again, the Vatican, which for all intents and purposes is... is under modernist control now, they're not going to come out and blow the horn on themselves and say, yep, we're in a great apostasy. Yep, we're on the verge of the formal New Age religion coming into play. I wanted to get your take because it kind of ties in uh, with this this topic of diversion or deception even. You know, did Father Martin talk about um, aliens and how that ties in with the New Age? And I can, again, people who follow this apostolate, you know, our basic position is, What's going on is certainly demonic. Uh, the whole alien uh, agenda to me is simply a bridge into the New Age religion. Once they have this disclosure, which, by the way, could happen before this year is up. They've been saying now Hillary Clinton, if she becomes elected, she's going to say the, you know, aliens are real, basically. Now, there's government programs, Project Bluebeam being one of them, that kind of uncovers this whole mess. But there's a lot of propaganda to suggest that when this happens... What the mainstream will say is, you've been interpreting the Bible all along. Look, can't you see the aliens around us? Your, your, your interpretation of the Bible is erroneous. So they're going to go with an even newer interpretation. If Vatican II isn't bad enough, we're sliding even closer into the New Age. And it, and it ties in with Maitreya and these ascended masters and all this great stuff. But he, did he talk in detail about you know aliens in general? I want to get into the New Age later, but specifically with aliens and UFOs. Well, he didn't really talk extensively about uh, that. I think that's something that would be used by the, the New Age to distract people away, again, from the, the Christian religion. Um, again, there's n nothing particularly new about it, because I remember reading uh, in, the, in the 1970s a book called Crash for the Chariots, in which uh, some evangelical Protestant argued that a lot of what they said was... Um, the aliens wasn't actually so, but it's, I think, being used to, again, distract away from the uh, Christian message. And what, you, what we have seen over the past, like, uh, years, as, like, the, the layers of uh, mass media mount up, is that the Christian message is more and more and more uh, being pushed kind of to the margins, and that's one reason I applaud uh, what you're doing, let's say, with the internet media, because this is an attempt to bring uh, the, the uh, Christian or, more specifically, the traditional Catholic message back into the, the mainstream where it belongs. Because this is what Malachi Martin had said. The Jesuits of old would have uh, taken over the internet as... Uh, they in the past had taken over the main institutions in society to propagate, propagate the uh, Catholic religion. Not today's Jesuits, because in his book, The Jesuits, he's kind of documented um, how 
the uh, Jesuits have kind of fallen away from the faith. Sure. But the Jesuits of old, he said, would have taken over the uh, uh, internet and Christianity would have been the main message. So I certainly applaud your efforts to do exactly what uh, Malachi Martin said the Jesuits should have been doing. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, that's that's exactly what we try to do, Bernard, is become as visible as we can uh, before the material chastisement side of this. Uh, hopefully we can get into that a little bit, you know, comes into play. But we're trying to rub up against mainstream individuals, and I've run into some very prominent names who I'm trying to teach as I'm interviewing and talking with you. I'm trying to incorporate the message of Fatima. So I, I do it, very, you know, deliberately and on purpose so that they're aware of, you know, our point of view. If you could talk to maybe this point, you know, our Lord said in these end times, charity would grow cold. We're seeing more and more animosity building up, almost like a bad energy, as I was talking with a, a family member. And I know Father Malachi Martin talked about this pretty extensively and how this ties in with perfect possession, with people who you would see on the surface as calm, whether they're bankers, whether they're, the, you know, the government puppets of the world, but they're perfectly possessed individuals, you know, under the auspices of the false light of Lucifer, who are leading people into this formal new age, if you will, the, the, the new world order. If you could talk a little bit about that, because I know, you know, he was saying at certain points that a lot of Roman Catholic priests were getting knocked off, they were being killed. And uh, maybe you could even talk about how there's a good number of people who actually think that maybe Father Martin was, you know, taken out. Um, I would say there's a growing number of people who believe that. So talk about that a little bit. Perfect possession. Uh, maybe some stories that you could relate with, with Father Martin talking about that. Well, there's a very important uh, point to know about Satanism or Luciferianism. Uh, many of us have the idea is that these Satanists are like a group of uh, freaky people, that they are outcasts, they come from the lower echelons of society. Um, in some cases, this may be true. But he pointed out that... Um, very often, these Luciferians are in high positions. They're sitting as uh, Supreme Court justices. They are cardinals in the Catholic Church. They are um, holding um, uh, seats in the legislatures of the United States and Canada and other Western nations. So they are very prominent uh, business people. So in, in, in many cases, these uh, Luciferians are in very senior positions. They're not kind of uh, these uh, outcast kind of people that the media sometimes portrays them as. That's a very, very important point. Now, you did mention something that it is important to mention. Um, Malachi Martin was in the midst of uh, doing an exorcism when he died. And so the circumstances of his death are very mysterious. Wow. And I, I think that the movie that is coming out about uh, Malachi Martin will be dealing with this topic. Unbelievable. And I, I didn't know that, honestly. I didn't know he was actually in the midst of an exorcism. I know he had was making implications of the material chastisements. And many of us we're kind of wondering, because we see a lot of these people who are talking about Planet X and stuff being knocked off, whether it's uh, Robert Harrington and NASA and some of these other, we we're always kind of wondering, okay, he was talking about that a lot towards, you know, the mid, late 90s, and we're like, okay, did they get at him, you know, for that reason? And maybe maybe it's not that reason. Maybe it's what, what you're implying here, which is kind of interesting. Well, I have an idea. I have an idea. He was working on a another book. Um, remember Windswept House? Yeah. Uh, it had very graphic details about the problems in the church. It showed like some of the characters actually uh, being murdered in one case. Yeah. Now, um, what he was working on in the book that he was working on was not fiction. Windswept House disguised yeah. a lot of things as fiction. That was the genre he did, I think, maybe to, partly to protect himself. Okay. This book that he was writing was going to expose the whole agenda wow. of the Luciferian faction in, in the Vatican. And um, he was going to name names. Oh, my goodness. 
may, maybe, maybe the devil did not want this book to be released. That's a theory. We do not know, but it's a possibility. He was certainly working on a blockbuster book, and that book then never got published. Wow. I didn't know that either. That is amazing. And certainly that could play an intricate part to the puzzle of the mystery of uh, Father Martin. You can get with Father Kramer on that. He has his own ideas from his contacts inside the Vatican. I'll let you two hook up and talk about that. We talked about that briefly on Facebook the other day. Um, what was Father Malachi Martin's relationship? You know, once he came over to the United States, started whistleblowing on all of this stuff. You know, what was his relationship like uh, with Archbishop Lefebvre, the society at the time? And he always kind of made mention of this underground church. Maybe we could spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, you know, obviously this was going back, what, in the 80s and the 90s, and take a look at where we're at now here in 2016, approaching the 100-year anniversary of Fatima. And uh, what, what, what would you say to that level? But then also, as a follow-up question... What, what would Father Martin say today, you know, what, what was going on? I mean, it seems to me there's, there's some in the quote-unquote traditionalist movement are moving back towards modernist Rome. I don't quite think that Father Martin would be one of those. I think he would be tooting a horn like we are. Maybe you could speak to that for a few minutes. Well, uh, Malachi Martin was always a supportive of uh, Archbishop uh, Lefebvre. He made Malachi Martin also though maintained his independence, right. he didn't actually, okay, become a member of or sure. officially endorse uh, the Society of St. Pius X because he felt he could do more as an independent. And he told me that he supported Archbishop Lefebvre and uh, he, he was in contact with uh, Bishop Williamson, but by being independent, he could get them uh, in information. Wow. It, he, he would just officially go with them, then his sources of information would have dried up. So he felt he could do more as an independent, but he certainly was very supportive of the work that Archbishop Lefebvre was doing. If you notice uh, in the interviews that we did, he would, whenever he talked about the uh, Society of St. Pius X and Archbishop Lefebvre, it was, always, um, it was always very positive. He regarded them as... Uh, part of the underground church, which he said was necessary, because the faith was being wiped out very often in, in the official uh, church. Um, statues, let's say, were being thrown out of uh, parishes, for example. So it was necessary to form an underground church in order to preserve the faith, because it was being wiped out um, in the official church. That was his point of view. Yeah, very, very interesting take. Uh, another question concerning Father Mar Malachi Martin. Again, I have with me Bernard Jansen. Make sure you get to his website. I'll repeat it once again for you. Triumphcommunications.net. Get there. He's got a great uh, box set coming out on Father Malachi Martin called The Wisdom of the Ages. Only $80. Uh, and certainly something I'm taking a look into but again, he's a wealth of knowledge. He knew individuals uh, very uh, intimately, you could say. Uh, Father Malachi Martin, inside and out. Bishop Williamson, which we hope to get him on in the not-so-distant future to do an episode with him. If we could talk further about his uh, thesis, if you will, on, on poisoned popes in the Vatican. Maybe John Paul I. Um, Cardinal Syria a little bit. There's a, a popular video that we have out. Uh, I believe it's off of uh, one of your interviews that's entitled Poison Popes and, and Cardinal Syria. It kind of just shows you how deeply entrenched they are um, in the Vatican, these, these Freemasonic, Luciferian. Could I talk about uh, Cardinal Syria? Sure, yeah. Because uh, uh, Malachi Martin did talk about uh, Cardinal Syria. He did say that... Uh, not once, but twice, he had enough uh, votes to uh, become Pope. Okay. But um, he declined it. And uh, the reason he declined it is because uh, he believed that uh, he would not live if he, if he became uh, Pope. In other words, he was afraid for his life. Yeah. So that shows 
that there are very uh, powerful Luciferian forces in the Vatican, and they will not hesitate to use uh, horrible means to uh, get rid of who they want to get rid of. And I think um, it wasn't done violently in the case of Pope Benedict, but that Pope Benedict actually was pushed aside by what Malachi Martin called the super force. Yeah, that's interesting you said that, because that's, that's actually one of the arguments that Father Kramer and I have used, is that, you know, this, this mafia came out, this, this even more progressive, and again, I'm not making excuses for Benedict XVI, his teachings were atrocious too, uh, we would label him as a modernist, but there was even more progressive Luciferian forces that pushed him out, and I have this documented in one of my videos called Back to the Catacombs, where it was recorded, this is by mainstream Novus Ordo sites, that indeed, it was about six months or so before him being pushed aside, that uh, he was poisoned. There was poison attempts. There was several cardinals that came out and said this, just like John Paul I. So, and then there's uh, this past half year, of course, Cardinal Daniels came out, who's just off his gourd, in my opinion, with, with the positions he takes on theology. Then uh, Cardinal Martini, who's a known Freemason, they all said, yeah, we tried to, we were pushing Benedict XVI out to get Francis uh, into place. Um, just... It's just mind-blowing, just the, the depth and the level of, of, of what's going on there in the Vatican. But my next question actually is a more common question. You know, there's a lot of attacks, uh, Bernard, on Malachi Martin. I would argue personally that they come from a lot of the State of Acontis camp. And again, personally, I have nothing against State of Acontis. I, I, you know, State of Acontis, we don't agree with them. But, you know, there's some sensible ones. But then there's some more off-the-fringe types that are always trying to attack Father Malachi Martin. And, you know, they'll use, he's a womanizer, he's a this or that. Maybe you could talk on the question of state of occultism, maybe why he didn't adopt that and, and, and why, you know, the attacks, especially as of late, they seem to be more prevalent. Well, I think that uh, a reason why the state of occultists, uh, some of them anyway, yeah, so. uh, don't like uh, Malachi Martin is that he never really adopted uh, their position. Sure. He felt that... Um, at the time that uh, John Paul II was doing um, a lot of damage to the Catholic Church, but I don't think he went as far as to say he wasn't full. And in some cases, uh, one could argue that perhaps it's even worse if John Paul II or, or Francis are legitimate popes, because then the damage that they're doing is greater. And um, so he never adopted their position, but in a way, there is there should be more common ground between Sedevi Pontus and uh, other, if you want to call it more mainstream traditionalists, because in a way, we're all sort of uh, ignoring uh, the authorities and going ahead and doing. Uh, what we can to pre preserve the church. I think that Malachi Martin regarded it as a shame that traditional Catholics would be, let's say, fighting on trivial issues when, like you'd say, the, the, the bark of Peter is burning down. Would you also say that the Fatima message is pretty critical to that? Because obviously in the Fatima message we're told that a pope would consecrate you know, Russia would be done late, and according to their thesis, that just doesn't fly with them because we don't have a pope. So I, I, I find many of them, they don't even want to touch the, the, that topic because Father Martin stood so adamantly behind the, the message of Fatima as, as we do. It doesn't fly with their thesis, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, that's a fa that is a factor, too, because our lady's mandate was for the pope to release the third secret of Fatima no later than 1960. There's the consecration that has to be uh, done by the popes in union with the bishops. If um, these are not legitimate authorities, how can Our Lady's mandate be carried out? And like I said, I think it can be even worse if these people are legitimate authorities because um, then they're doing more damage than if they weren't really holding real offices. Yeah, that speaks to the diabolical disorientation that we're in there's you know i've always said this listen we say the things that we say at trad cat night we say it very adamantly i'm not the magisterium you take it at face value and and form your own opinions and, and 
just just research just keep researching this is why you want to get to bernard's works because he has interviewed more than enough people for you to understand the crisis in this church and again i have a lot of friends who are sensible state of a contest but that's, that's really what i wanted to get to next is you know kind of your take on the whole i guess we'll label it traditionalist movement there are just so many opinions now it seems like everywhere you look it's fractioned I mean, even in the resistance right now, it's kind of fractioning and falling apart. I mean, you can see the hand of the devil in this. I mean, he's, he's trying to split people all over the place on a, a wide number of positions. And it goes to speak to our, our, our times, I think, that this is kind of like the last bastion before God's hand kind of comes down and, and, and you know, his justice enters into the world. Well, Malachi Martin was a, a Jesuit. The Jesuits... Uh had a, uh, a fourth vow of obedience to the papacy because they believed that the papacy was essential and very crucial to the uh, Catholic Church. Um, if you see what's happened to the Protestant denominations over the past uh, several hundred years, they've uh, fractured and splintered and, and fragmented. And I think now that the shepherd is struck in the Catholic Church, we're seeing a similar uh, fragmentation. Um, it's not really a reason for despair because it's something that's very predictable. If you do not have an effective government of the church, well, it's inevitable that the rest of us will start to quarrel and, and, and to uh, yeah. fragment. And I think that calls for the fact that we do need a, a strong and good pope and I don't think like Humpty Dumpty is going to be put back together again until we do get such a pope. Until then, um, like uh, what we have to do is what you're doing in, in your apostolate and what I'm doing in mine, basically being voices crying in the wilderness, until such time yeah. as the governing machinery of the church can get us act together and put things back together again. But until that happens, you can expect more fragmentation. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And it's, it's it starts at the top with leadership. Bishop Williamson has said this over and over again. And I, I think that's what these chastisements will do is basically pave the way for that. You know, this period of purification will pave the way for leadership to have the cataracts removed from their eyes, so to speak, much like uh, Saul into Paul. I mean, that, that veil will be lifted over the eyes and they'll say, yep, okay, now I get it. And that's going to be interesting times to say the least. Now, another hot topic was how Father Martin talked about how before the Second Vatican Council, Lucifer was actually enthroned. If you can kind of talk about that uh, more specifically, because many, many people still don't grasp that. I mean, I have a lot of people coming from the Noah's Horde, and they say, what are you talking about? I mean, that's all conspiracy. I mean, there, there's no way that, the, the, that God would allow, you know, churchmen to be handed over to essentially Luciferianism. Well, it, it sounds, it sounds far-fetched, it sounds fantastic, but unfortunately the facts would seem to bear things up. Um, how else could you explain that a, a church which was thriving up until the Second Vatican Council would just uh, fall apart? Now don't forget that Pope Leo XIII had heard like conversations between um, God and Satan, and he instituted the Leonine prayers at the end of the Mass as a, as a barrier against, let's say, the Church falling to Luciferian forces. But one of the changes that was made to the liturgy during the 1960s was to remove these prayers. So it was like taking down your defenses. So then don't be surprised if these guys have taken over. The Church has basically taken down the walls that were defending us. Yeah. Unbelievable. And, and again, I, I learned so much from uh, Father Martin, um, just sitting back and listening to your interviews almost on a nightly basis. When I first understood there was something very gravely wrong, and I started to discover, you know, this message of Fatima and how essentially, you know, it truly opposes the new world order because you have this new tower of Babel being constructed, if you will, completely on the humanitarian level, what Pope St. Pius X labeled the impotent humanitarianism. And that's all this is is about, you know, civic ideals. We're, we're being pushed into this one world socialist republic. And the Fatima message stands adamantly against that. And what's interesting is we have Russia as the key piece 
you know, not the United Nations or Israel, as so many people in the Novus Ordo or even Protestants, uh, you know, tend to want to think that, you know, somehow the UN's going to save us or, or even, you know, the puppet state of Israel will. You know, he made mention of just, you know, how important, you know, the message of Fatima is to combating uh, Lucifer. Because this ultimately, in the end, is a battle between Christ and Lucifer and the Catholic Church and her enemies. In all of this, Russia has been a very important instrument. It was um, through Russia that Luciferianism was sort of uh, spread throughout the world after the uh, Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. But Malachi Martin did also say in her interviews that salvation would come from the East, and a time will come um, when Russia will be converted. Um, Father Paul Trinchard pointed out in some interviews that I did with him that uh, the Russian Orthodox Church had a certain corruption that Malachi Martin had talked about, I mean, that it was riddled with uh, KGB agents. But Father Trinchard also pointed out that it was spared sort of the um, modernist philosophies that took over the Catholic Church and most Protestant denominations. And so then, once the consecration is, is done, and the Russian Orthodox Church becomes Catholic, there will be a whole army of priests that can kind of uh, go out and re-catechize um, the West, because the Russian Orthodox Church was spared sort of the, the modernistic uh, corruption that afflicted uh, most Protestant denominations before Vatican II and the Catholic Church after Vatican II. So Russia is a very important instrument of God's message, and Malachi Martin believed that uh, salvation uh, would come from the East. Um, in our Apostolate Tribe Communications, we are currently uh, promoting a Rosary Crusade for the uh, conversion of uh, uh, Russia, Good. and this should be available soon on our website if it isn't already. Good, absolutely, yeah, wonderful. And yeah, if you have any articles along that line, Bernard, be sure to send them to me via email. I'll get them out for you. We'll get it hooked up to your website so we get more traffic flowing to your page. But that is one thing that we all should be praying for on a daily basis uh, is the consecration of Russia. And just overall, you know, this this more brief period of the, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, which is coming, ladies and gentlemen. I keep saying this. People keep looking, you know, over to the east and to the west. You know, where is it coming from? We are it. You know, I'm not suggesting we're all getting through this storm, but we're what's going to constitute that uh, eventual emergence, if you will. And that's how close we are, in my opinion. Now, one of the things I loved about Father Martin amidst all of these things is uh, his, his bold stance against this, what I call the culture of self or the culture of death. I mean, we, you just see death all around us with these Luciferians, whether it's uh, Moloch worship with abortion here in the West. Um, you know, being pro-choice and all this nonsense, but, you know, and also suicide. I reported on this, um, what, what he called Satan's eighth sacrament, in, in, I believe in one of your videos. We're seeing suicides on the rise now, and I've been warning people, start detaching your hearts. That's one of the things that's meant to be an ego, is to detach your hearts from all things, because only faith and hope is going to survive. And those who are attached to those things, the gadgets and gadgets, they're not going to be able to process all the changes that are going to be needed. And so we're seeing higher suicide rates amongst uh, the younger. And the, the highest category was actually like the 13 through the 16 year olds, which is sad. And so maybe speak, you know, for a few minutes on, on what Father Martin had said concerning, you know, the culture of self, the culture of death, abortion. Uh, I would like to, uh, let's say, talk about uh, my country of uh, Canada. Sure. Uh, now, but first I'd like to point out that Malachi Martin said that you can see uh, certain footprints. Certain footprints are uh, from Satan. He said abortion is one of these, and suicide is a footprint of Satan. Now, what just happened in uh, Canada was that our Supreme Court struck down uh, the laws against euthanasia, and uh, Doctor-assisted suicide 
is being introduced um, in Canada officially. And yet at the same time, um, a lot of people are alarmed at the increasing numbers of suicides of young people uh, in our high schools in Canada, on our Indian reservations. So we're sending our young people mixed messages. On one hand, um, the government is saying we have introduced doctor-assisted suicide and this is such a good thing because now people won't have to suffer uh, pains in, in uh, dying so much. Yeah. And yet at the same time, they're saying, oh, it's bad that these young people in high schools and on Indian reserves, so many of them are committing suicide. And there is uh, a suicide epidemic now in Canada. I don't have figures in the United States, but I do believe the same trends are probably working there. But uh, Canada is more cutting edge. Like the liberal agenda is usually introduced earlier in Canada than in the United States. Yeah, I would say that the trends there in Canada certainly hold true with, with here in the United States. And again, it's just it's just sad. In a certain sense, uh, it's kind of a tie-in question. In a certain sense, that's bad. That trend is moving in the wrong direction. But what I'm also noticing with the youth is there's, there's more and more people asking questions and more and more younger individuals coming into what we would just label tradition, I guess. Those who see Vatican II for what it's worth, and it's, it's not worth anything really in the reality of things. Uh, now, are, are you seeing the same thing in, in Canada? I mean, you mentioned how more and more people are pushing for Father Martin, but just in general, are, are you finding more people waking up to tradition? And, and if so, you know, what's the demographics behind that? Yeah. I mean, is it is it mainly here in the West? Is it the younger? Is it the older? Break that down for us a little bit from your perspective. Well, I think this is a trend which has been going on a long time. It's not entirely new. Before uh, Michael Davies passed away, he noticed that in the traditional movement that its uh, activists have been getting younger and younger uh, for some time, and I think that trend is continuing. You have things getting better and worse at the same time. The overall trend is continuing to fall into this Luciferian uh, new world order, but God's grace continues to work. So while the airs get deeper and deeper, um, the truth kind of flourishes in a way more and more. So a, a certain minority of people are waking up. And I don't think that this uh, minority, you can say, are young people, old people. Um, I, I think it's across the board. You have people of all age groups that, that are kind of waking up to the fact that Modernity, in the words of uh, Bishop Langston, are a busted flush. And so people across the board are coming to tradition. But so far, it's still a minority. Maybe in, in the East, like the trend is stronger. Because from what, what I know, churches in, the, let's say, the Ukraine or in uh, Belarus or Russia are, are filling up and primarily with young people in in Canada, the United States, Western Europe, I think it's it's more a minority trend at this point. But yeah. it's there, and it shows that God's grace has not been extinguished. Um, and the Luciferians, however they try, are not going to be able to win a, a, a total victory because the very fact that uh, Archbishop Lefebvre and the Society of St. Pius X were able to preserve the traditional Latin Mass at all was a defeat for Satan and a victory for tradition. Yeah, great points. And that was actually my next question I wanted to tie into because there seems to be some confusion out there as to what Father Martin truly taught on the new Mass. Now, I believe in some of the videos they're rather dated, and I think this was prior to the changes of uh, Benedict the Sixteenth, where he changed the words of consecration from for all to uh, for many properly. Um, and I actually always argued with the state of a contest there that per, I think it was council of Trent that that would have made the mass invalid, but it, it was changed. But, you know, from our perspective, we hold what Bishop Williamson, uh, has held what Archbishop Lefebvre taught father Kramer, you know, the new mass or father Hess, even, um, you know, the new mass is elicited and schismatic. Now, 
what's your take on the new master? What was Father Martin's take? Uh, because there, there's a couple of videos out there. I think it's by State of Contest even that you know Father Martin had said, you know, either all or like the majority of masses were invalid or I forget how they they worded it, but there seems well, to be confusion. I can shed some light on this topic because uh, uh, I know the views of uh, Malachi Martin fairly well. I think on the question of the mass, he he went perhaps a little further than Archbishop Lefebvre did. He believed that the new Mass, as it was celebrated, let's say, in the United States, or Great Britain, or Canada, was uh, invalid because of the words of consecration were wrong. They were using the words for all uh, rather than for many as uh, should have been used. Um, he did believe that the new Mass in its original Latin, though, was valid. So in that way, he doesn't go as far as some of the set of contests do, who say that just the, the new masses is, is uh, always invalid. Now, since then, and some of this may have been due to the uh, pressure that uh, uh, Malachi Martin was exerting through uh, various communications challenge, channels, um, well, Benedict did change uh, the words of uh, concentration in English-speaking countries back to uh, for many. And so I, I think perhaps he would argue that in more cases, um, the mass uh, would be valid more often. However, I don't think that was his sole objection to uh, the new mass. But he did say that using the words for all rather than for many, would invalidate it. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Yeah, there, we, we got a lot of questions in, in, in that regards, and I just, since you knew him so well, I wanted you to clear that up. Um, you know, as you know, the internet, <laughs> it, it can be kind of spotty at times with getting uh, reliable information. Uh, you know, now, question he did say, uh, he, he did say and point out that the Council of Trent had clearly called for the words to be for many. Yeah. And also, uh, Malachi Martin was an expert about uh, ancient uh, Middle Eastern languages. And some of the modernists claim that actually uh, for all was the uh, correct translation. Yeah, the better all. translation, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he, he pointed out that in all his knowledge, of uh, these ancient uh, Middle Eastern languages, that that simply wasn't the case. That this this is a pure fabrication on the part of the modernists. Yeah, maybe you could speak to this. Um, you know, we talked about diabolical disorientation a little bit while ago. This this is a universal deception where what is being labeled Catholics is not Catholic, and that's how the moder modernist mind works. I mean, they're labeling something Catholic. I always use the example of. You know, a, a glass of water being labeled with a Coke label. You know, you go ahead and drink it, and the modernists say it's Coke, and we clearly see that it's water. It's something different. And that's kind of the diabolical disorientation from, from my perspective, my opinion. So it's a mass deception. Go ahead. Um, the modernists are, are twisting uh, very badly what it means to be Catholic. And I'll use oh, an yeah. example. Um, in the Archdiocese of Ottawa, there was a group of tradition-minded priests who set up an oratory. And they were trying as much as they could within the framework of the official church to bring back tradition sure. at this oratory. And they were, um, let's say, adding more and more statues to uh, the church. Now, there was somebody there they, who opposed what they were doing. Actually, there was a lot of opposition to what they were doing, and eventually they got driven out of the uh, diocese. Um, wow. But there was one person who was a modernist who wrote that there were getting to be so many statues in this church that it no longer looked like a Catholic church. So the modernists have bent what the word Catholic to mean something else than what, what it uh, traditionally meant. They're, they're very good at uh, being manipulators of language. Yeah, that's that's just it. You nailed it right on the head. We've been warning about that for years now. Is that they're 
identification of what is Catholic truly isn't Catholic. And that's why you see so many falsely obeying from our perspective is they want to, in, in their human nature, follow obedience and the authority. But what can you do when what they're teaching isn't Catholic? And we go to tradition, we find resistance, just like St. Athanasius had to resist the heretical bishops at, uh, at his time. That's what we have to do now. But it is, it's a delicate situation like you said, Bernard, and I know I have to do a better job sometimes. I, I kind of label them pseudo-trad, pseudo-traditionalists, but listen, we're all trying to figure this thing out. There's a lot of confusion, so there needs to be more compassion. Certainly on my end, I need to, need to do a better job. Um, but my well, next... I certainly think that Malachi Martin's uh, voice has to be considered as we try to hash things out, because um, he had knowledge of things that the rest of us don't have. He, he knew unfortunately, kind of the darker side of the supernatural realm. He has read The Third Secret. So whatever he has to say, of course, it's it's not defide, but his arguments, because he has this information, has to be seriously considered. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, he's a backbone, a backbone piece to this. Uh, for me, Archbishop Lefebvre, Father Malachi Martin, you know, the Father Kramers, Father Hess, you know, to just to name a few, Bishop Williamson, I mean... We have to really sit back, and if we take our faith seriously, we have to listen to these individuals who've been there, done that, and Father Malachi Martin was on the inside. And that's kind of what I want to get to next, if we can, Th the third secret of Fatima, more, I, I guess, more in detail, if we, if we can. Uh, from my perspective, from piecing this all together, obviously, it's the Second Vatican Council, but then it's also this coming formal New Age religion, and there's always a piece that I use wherein he does give a time frame, and I think it was in 1998, I think it was 1998 or 1997, he was asked a time frame, and he says it's less than 20 years away. So in my opinion, I, I think he was kind of alluding to this formal New Age structure arriving in Rome. Correct me if I'm wrong, and feel free to say, hey, no, you're wrong, Eric, but it seems to me that that's what we are on the precipice of. I've been warning of this false prophet character, this esoteric character that, in my opinion, is going to show up after Francis kind of bails out, um, who's going to establish this formal New Age religion, according to their own writings, by the way. Um, am I wrong there? I mean, what, what, what's that time frame he's talking about? Well, you think? Malachi Martin believed that uh, the Luciferians, the architects of the New World Order, for some reason are in a very tight timeline. They want to get um, as much done as they can in a hurry. And this is why I think that Malachi Martin believed this. He had kind of this knowledge of uh, the supernatural realm. And uh, he, Malachi Martin believed that in the modern era, the chains of um, Lucifer have been loosed. In other words, he has more power today than he had, let's say, during the, the thousand years of the Middle uh, Ages. And so he's trying to do as much damage and take as many souls to hell as possible uh, during this short time that he has, because he knows also his time is limited. And so he's trying to do as much damage as he can within this tight timeline. I think that's the supernatural explanation for what is going on. And I think that's really the crux of it. There is a cosmic battle, as Malachi Martin pointed out. There's a cosmic battle between good and evil here. And right now, apparently, although not actually, um, the side of evil has the upper hand. And that reflects into our politics, it reflects into our music, it reflects into our religion, it reflects into our culture. And that's really what's happening here. There's a cosmic battle between good and evil. Unless you understand that, you're not really getting to the heart of the matter. And he even talked to some of the authors of books who have um, tried to provide explanations of what's going on. But he says they don't really uh, get down to the heart of the matter. They're only dealing with uh, the surface. Now, I think another piece to the puzzle here, and I, I don't necessarily remember or recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, interviews where he um, made the direct implication of, but there are many concerned that 
a piece to the puzzle here is the, the material chastisements which are approaching. And I think maybe that ties in also with why the powers that be are trying to hurry and rush and get much of their agenda across because it seems that a large space body is approaching us. And I know I, I've seen in several instances where he, he told to pay attention to the skies. I actually had a couple other people, so you know this, who knew Father Martin well that said the same thing to me, just so you know. Uh, they, they said they knew him very well. And they said, yeah, pay attention to the skies. They even made mention that John Paul II was awaiting for this sign in the, in the sky, so to speak. But nevertheless, um, was, was that maybe mentioned to you either privately or what do you kind of gather from that on the material chastisement side of things and, and a potential large space object approaching us and how that will introduce the new age? Because I've been warning in my extensive knowledge of the new age that that's going to be their, their telltale sign to get the new age going is when you see this star sign in the sky, that's when you know all hell's going to break loose. And I believe father Martin had mentioned this in, in some of the interviews. Well, uh, Malachi Martin did say, look to the skies. He also is aware that the Vatican has an observatory, so it must be um, important to the people in the Vatican as well, or they wouldn't have this observatory. Um, it's hard to say, like, the form that this will take. Very often, momentous events in history have been preceded by events in the skies. For example, uh, three wise men, they did follow um, the star to yeah. uh, the birth of uh, Jesus. Um, it could be said it's interesting that there was a comet uh, in the skies at the time of uh, the Norman conquest of England. Yeah. So, yes, but I'm not really knowledgeable enough myself to exactly say okay. what form it will take. And that's one of the aspects of prophecy, too, is, is that there's always a certain sense of, of mystery. We're never going to really know it all in advance the date and that, because that would make things too easy for us. Like our Lord said, you would not know the, the day or the hour. So we're always kind of uh, kept on edge a bit so that, that we're vigilant in maintaining our prayer life and in keeping on the straight and narrow and going to confession because we don't know exactly to the date when we are going to die. We don't know when these world events are going to happen. And very often when they do happen, they happen in ways that we don't expect. Now, what about Father Malachi Martin's take on the warning? I know he was pretty adamant about, uh, I believe it was Garen Bendal, but many uh, are suggesting that there'll, there'll be, you know, even a warning before uh, the sign. And yeah, by the way, I wanted to follow up on that. That's actually what the New Age say in their writings. It's it's a counterfeit. It's a counterfeit to, you know, when everything gets bad in the world, they're going to the world's going to be looking for a new Messiah, right? Which we know from scripture and tradition is going to be under uh, under the Jews. We'll rebuild the third temple, which which, which is what they're doing, by the way. Uh, I've been on record as saying, and I think Father Martin actually disagreed with me that I think this this New Age Antichrist is the Maitreya. All roads lead back to him. Um, and this false prophet character, his sidekick's gonna, sidekick, is going to show up in Rome here sh soon, whose name is uh, Yeshua ben Joseph. But did he give you any details, you know, about the the warning, you know, um, just in, well, in our, in our interviews, he did he did speak about uh, the warning. I think it has to do with uh, that people will know the state of their souls. Um, he, I don't uh, recall it enough. Uh, but it's, it, it's, it's in the books, and he does talk about uh, the warning that will come. He does talk about uh, Gare Bandel. He did believe that Gare Bandel was, a, like, uh, was an authentic uh, appearance of Our Lady. He said he preferred to use the word appearance of Our Lady rather than an apparition. Okay. Now, what, tell us a little bit more about Father Martin. Obviously, you knew him far better than the majority of us do. Tell, tell us a little bit more about the man, the priest, who he was, uh, you know, something, maybe even one thing that we wouldn't know about Father Malachi Martin that, that you would, you know, someone who would be more closely connected to him. Well, I observed someone who was very conscious of his mortality, maybe because he did have this uh, contact with the supernatural when he did uh, exorcisms. Um, he was very conscious of his mortality. Um, 
he regularly went to confession to a uh, a 90 year old priest i accompanied him once uh, he was also i think a very genuine man one time he came late to one of the interviews that i had scheduled because he'd been buying food for a hungry family uh-huh. in new york so he, he was very much a, a, a man that actually uh, didn't just talk about uh, the virtues. He exercised the virtues, too. Yeah, that, that's kind of the impression that I got from him. And that's what we have to do in these days is, is walk the walk. We can't just talk the talk. we got to get out there and do works of mercy, you know, acts of charity, let people know. Uh, you know, we're not these quote unquote just Bible thumpers. I mean, we truly are trying to live out the message of Christ as uh, traditional Catholics in a world, which is just, it's very, it's very hard to even find the true faith. Um, well, Malachi Martin was such a person who walked the talk. Um, he was in contact with an enormous number of people that uh, came to him for advice, and he, he sort of uh, was a celebrity. But he always had time for people. He noticed that uh, whenever someone would phone him or write to him uh, for advice or um, for help, that they, they would always uh, get an answer. So he had time for people in spite of being a celebrity. Yeah, that, that's again, that's the impression that I picked up for him. Um, just, just a wealth of knowledge. It's really sad to see some of the attacks. Uh, on him once again i have with me bernard jansen make sure you get to his website ladies and gentlemen triumphcommunications.net i'll leave all of this in the description box so that you can get there and read uh all of the cd recordings the books the videos the articles he has uh this is just like plethora of 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 information here that many people uh don't see they're not seeing this for whatever reason and that's why i want to help bernard get this his work out and especially specifically here with his latest work, Wisdom of the Ages, um, you know, eight books by Malachi Martin. And maybe we can get at, get into that here in a minute. Maybe we'll, we'll, we can talk about one section and then you can just kind of roll with it and t- tell us what it's about. Um, but a more general question is, a lot of people are feeling very alienated. That's one of the things I try to do. I try to do this once or twice a week is actually just hold phone conversations with people who just feel like they have no outlet. I mean, they, they see how bad it is now. What, what can an everyday Catholic do? I mean, are there networks forming to where, you know, it's just on social media or can pe- local people get together and say, hey, you know, we commonly believe in these things? Kind of relating to the, the underground uh, church uh, area. And, I, you know, my thing, Bernard, is I hope people don't fall into despair because it's only going to get worse. I mean, it's going to get really bad. And if people are already on the verge of kind of cracking and snapping at this point, that's not really a good sign. So faith and hope is what I preach as an essential part of the third, you know, of, of the message, message of Fatima, of being an eagle, of spreading your, your wings in faith and hope. That, that's what we have to rely upon. Well, it is understandable that people would feel alienated because, okay, suppose you have a person that grew up in the, in the pre-Vatican II church, and then all of a sudden... Um, their church is sort of taken away from uh, them. They're told, oh, you don't have to say uh, the rosary anymore, that's passe. They throw out the statues that they may be uh, sacrificed uh, financially to get for the church. Um, All of a sudden, everything has changed. Of course, they're going to feel alienated, but that is not a reason for despair. And in the uh, book, The Deserted Vineyard, Malachi Martin uh, does provide an answer, and that is that the church has a rich treasure chest of devotions, and we do, we can still do devotions such as uh, the uh, rosary and the stations of the cross and the, the oh, long list of uh, litanies that are in our uh, uh, daily missals. We can all do these without uh, the churchmen. No matter how bad the churchmen get, we can still do our uh, daily devotions, and that's what gives us uh, strength. And we have to return to these devotions, and that will uh, prevent us from falling into despair, because uh, in this life, um, we're not uh, guaranteed 
that we're going to be living in a thriving church or a thriving civilization. Um, collapse of various nations has happened has happened before. For example, all of uh, North Africa was Catholic at one time. It was the home of the great uh, St. Augustine of Hippo. All that now is lost to the church. So we're, if we aren't given guarantees uh, that the life here on earth that we're going to have is a good one, but we are given a guarantee that if we do our best and walk the talk and practice our faith and do acts of charity, that there will be a greater reward for us at the end of it. So is, is it safe to say, just as a follow-up question, outside of just educating you know, the, the everyday Catholic has to put in the time. I've been telling people now for years, and I'm, I'm very adamant about it, you know, shut the TV off, quit watching, you know, the Monday Night Football and dan Dancing with the Stars, and start actually reading the pre-Vatican II encyclicals and actually knowing your faith, because without the proper norm of faith, it's impossible to please God from Scripture. So outside of, uh, you know, educating ourselves, using, you know, your apostolate, my apostolate, and, and networking, is there really anything we anything else that we can do to kind of have some sort of organization and structure. I know, as you you uh, previously mentioned, devotions are key. And that's what I'm finding, too, is you see so many people running towards an experience with the charismatic movement, as opposed to doing these traditional devotions. And so uh, that would be a, a follow-up question. But then also a follow-up question would be Father Martin and the rosary, that connection. You know, how intimate, you know, did he preach, you know, the rosary? Well, he did preach the rosary. Um, he, he, the rosary is the most important of uh, the various uh, Catholic devotions uh, that we have. Uh, he considered it so important that he did, he did a full interview on the subject of devotions. And really, that's what's going to get us through um, this crisis in the church because our shepherds have abandoned us. So therefore, we have to uh, fall on our own devices. But he did say let's say, even at that time that w when he lived with the internet, that the truth is out there. But today, um, we have to make an effort to find it. Today, we have to make an effort to practice uh, the virtues, let's say, of charity. Today, we have to uh, make an effort to get down in our hearts because we're not going to have the church hierarchy just kind of uh, shepherding us to do it. Now it takes an individual effort. Yeah, I agree. So, so it's there to those who want it and those who are willing to make sacrifice to get it. Yeah, well, well said. And then once we get these individuals, you know, we, we have to, you know, be very compassionate and realize people are coming from all, they're coming from all walks of life. Again, none of us are the magisterium, but I, I would say most people now see, you know, Vatican II for what it's worth, you know, the sham that it is being, from my perspective, the pastoral implementation of this, this new religion, which is going to be finalized here soon. Uh, can you speak more, because you were around Father Martin a lot, you see a lot of the demonization going on of traditionalists, and I'm sure he probably had quite a few battles with some with some of the hierarchy and maybe some of the, the, the bishops uh, surrounding him. And I'll do a, a follow-up question as regards to, you know, this apostolate and just in general on traditionalists, but did you get to witness and, and, and see that, you know, the actual attacks on Father Martin from, you know, the modernists? Well, there were a lot of attacks on... Father Malachi Martin, um, but he, he was sort of uh, fairly nonchalant about it because he said that if uh, no one is attacking you, then you're not saying anything worthwhile. <laughs> so that uh, it's always been like that. Uh, I know that St. Athanasius was uh, accused of being a womanizer, so there's a parallel yeah. to... Uh, Malachi Martin, in that sense, uh, w when people go after him for being a womanizer, sometimes the message is so factual and so compelling that what the enemy has to resort to is what is called in Latin ad hominem attacks, yeah. because that's the only way that they have to take down a person, because how can you really defend back into all the statistics Malachi Martin referred to are plumb lying down. Seminary is empty. Church is empty. And it's taken a while for the full fruits of Vatican II to take place. But now what I see in the Novus Ordo churches uh, around here is that they're being kept open by a handful of uh, uh, 
uh, old people. There's been a total devastation. So they have to uh, use ad hominem attacks because that's really, in the end, all they have. The facts don't bear them up. Yeah, I completely agree with you. We, we've been attacked recently. I'm not sure if you're aware of the priest Father Longenecker. He's like a popular... Um, a popular Nova Sordo priest that came out and attacked this apostle, but other ones, you know, one Peter five, uh, you know, remnant, he came out and just, and, and I publicly emailed him on Facebook, you know, just letting him know, you know, he's a coward for saying the things that he's, he said about us, you know, bottom line is, you know, they're teaching and following this new religion. I have no idea what they're talking about. And they're, they're demonizing us. And father, uh, Rosica, who, who actually, banned me on my Twitter account. I've got La Observatore Romana who banned me. I've got Father Rosica. A good number of bishops have banned me. They don't want to hear the truth anymore. And they keep constantly running to, you know, we're crazy, we're nut jobs, we're conspiratorial. Now the latest is we're hateful. There's This is what's coming out in, in the Novus Ordo blogs. We're hateful. Anyone who attacks the hierarchy can't be, it can't be from the Holy Ghost. And again, by attack, it's just we're basically exposing the modernist teachings. It would be interesting. Well, you're in good company because uh, as long as I knew Malachi Martin, there was a steady drumbeat of attacks on him. And um, he just carried on and did what he had to do. And he might have responded to some of them, but uh, he, he didn't let it upset him to the point that it was going to interfere with what he had to do. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, you know, it, it, take it for what it's worth. Occasionally I'll, I'll go and, and have to defend my own name where they're slandering and doing things like that. But yeah, most of the time there, there's nothing you can do about it. We just march on. And as we get more and more into the mainstream, we're able to provide this information and it's going to bother. It's going to stir the, the hornet's nest up. And uh, so if we can, maybe we could transition a little bit into this eight book series and we could talk a little bit uh, more about it. Again, I want everyone to get to Bernard's website, uh, triumphcommunications.net, get, get this eight book set from Father Malachi Martin. It's only $80.00. And uh, you're going to learn a lot, I assure you. Uh, now, the first book there is called Catholicism Overturned. And, I, you know, in a more general sense, we've, we've kind of talked about some of this already. But we're now seeing the implementation of this New Age religion, which, again, Pope Paul VI himself, lady, ladies and gentlemen, called it the cult of man. Anyone who's studied secret societies knows that's not the Catholic religion. <laughs> the cult of man is very much Freemasonry. Uh, you know, maybe talk a little bit about that, you know, how even maybe Freemasonry fact factors into this. I'm not sure if Father Martin was as, as, as adamant as we are as the, how do we put this, the, the Jewish construct in place? Because ultimately, it truly is a battle between the two religions. And we know from tradition, the Antichrist is going to be a Jew, and he's going to reign in Jerusalem. And, and the stage is being set. I don't think really, people realize how close we are to the emergence of this, this, these certain key characters that will be arriving on the scene uh, soon. But maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how Father, what Father Martin's perspective was. Well, what I would like, you, you mentioned um, Pope Paul VI. I would like to, before moving on sure. to talk about the Antichrist, um, to talk a bit about Paul VI, because this is very important. Um, he regarded... Uh, Paul VI as being somewhat of an enigma because uh, on one hand he was the person that was uh, introducing the changes into the church. Yeah. He was change agent, yet at the same time he seemed to uh, be saddened by its effects. And uh, like he did say that uh, the smoke of Satan had entered into the sanctuary of the church. He did say that the church seems to be undergoing a mysterious process of self-demolition. So there you have it, the main change agent of the church, in a way, was not really um, endorsing Vatican II either. And I think one has to be a bit prepared for some of the... Um, cunning of the modernists. Oh, yeah. They may at some point drop Vatican II like a hot potato and move on to something else. Wow. Like That's an interesting Arthur, take. I think you will see... I think uh, perhaps Pope 
Genesis is a bit cutting edge on that point because I think I think what's going to come is that he's going to offer the Society of St. Pius X kind of a place in the church and he won't demand as has been demanded in the past right. that they endorse Vatican II and the reason is is because I think the modernists uh, regard Vatican II now as some of them regard it as passe. We moved on from that. That was an early stage of the revolution. Now we've moved on from that. In the same way that the agents of revolution, they endorsed Protestantism at, at the time of uh, Luther, but now you can say they've certainly moved beyond that. Wow, that's, that's, a, so, really, that's a really interesting point, Bernard. I, I really didn't think of that. That's very possible that they just they just drop it all together. But that's that's deceptive and cunning. And that's what kind of concerns us is that Bishop Filet is not seeing this. He even, you know, unfortunately, on the, the Society website, accepted the label of Catholic from Francis. And Francis is anything but Catholic. So that's kind of concerning to me. And a lot of people are like, uh, you know, I really shouldn't be pr promoting, you know, any kind of label from these modernists as, as Catholics. But uh, wow, really interesting take there. Um, whew. So in terms of, uh, is, was there any mention of, of Father Martin as, as to who he thought was the Antichrist? I mean, yeah, again, I think we'd have a disagreement on who this New Age person is coming. I really do believe it is Maitreya. But did he, did he ever say, I never could find an actual piece where, because I know he said he was alive. And, and working right now, but I don't recall him ever saying, okay, well, it's this person or, or that person. Well, I, I think we were, I have to remember, too, that when Malachi Martin uh, was alive, we were earlier in the process. Sure, yeah, of course. Uh, he first saw where it was going in general terms, and I'll, I'll use an example. He uh, argued that uh, there was, the Pope was going to uh, probably resign at some point. Now, he did get it slightly wrong because he was sort of expecting it would be um, John Paul II yeah. that would be uh, kind of um, pushed into resigning. So he got it slightly wrong, maybe. But actually, that did uh, eventually happen then with Benedict XVI that he was pushed into resigning. And to my knowledge, there was nobody else who saw um, that uh, the Pope would be uh, pushed into resigning. In fact, mm -hmm. some of the conservative, the, the editors of conservative periodicals said that, oh, Malachi Martin is really off the wall on this one, thinking that the Pope is going to resign. But it did happen. Yeah. And he, my knowledge, is the only major figure that saw it happen. Yeah, that, that's well said. And, and again, yeah, we, we recognize that, that far, you know, Martin wasn't trying to be a prophet. I mean, even Father Kramer got that wrong because I think Father Kramer echoed the same sentiments. All I can tell you is the study of New Age that this this false prophet character is said to be right outside Rome right now, and they have control of Francis, meaning they're open and they say, yeah, we're using him. And so we see Francis making all these occultic hand signs, the 666 and the hidden hand. You know, you put two and two together, it's like, you know, where do Catholics draw the line and say, I, you know, I can't be a part of this Nova Sordo anymore. I mean, what, what's, what was, you know, was there a breaking point for you? If you could share maybe where you were coming from, um, you know, because I think we all have kind of our own story as like where we made that line in the sand and said, okay, no more Vatican II, I'm, I'm out of here. Well, I, I'd like to put it maybe in another way. There are times when I have to go back to the Nova Sordo to see what is going on. Of course, there's sure. uh, marriages and funerals and what have you. And so you get a chance to observe the uh, uh, Norvis Ordo. Sure. And when I do that, I, I say to myself, there's there's no common ground here. I cannot see how you can possibly put tradition and the Norvis Ordo um, back together again. And in the letter, the, each year to our, um, our listeners and our benefactors and readers, we put out a letter. And in the letter last year, I made the case that it's on our website, that there really can be no um, agreement made between tradition and the Novus Ordo because there's no common ground at all. It's, it's two entirely different uh, religions. Yeah. It's two entirely different ways.
ways of thinking. Yeah, very well said. Again, I just wanted to get your take on that because I know people would be, you know, wondering, you know, you know, where what angle is Bernard coming from? And again, it is very trying times because we see our family members being inundated by this new religion, thinking it is Catholic. You know, many of these people they're they're not really putting in the time to understanding. So we have to continue to pray that rosary, ladies and gentlemen. Prayer and sacrifice, make reparation to the to the Sacred Heart through the Immaculate Heart. We've been preaching that here at Triad Cat Night. We're moving along here. I want to get back to the, you know, the, the eight. Um... Can I step in here? There's yeah. a very important point that kind of uh, like unfolds from this. That Malachi Martin viewed uh, the modern church primarily as a facade. Yeah. In other words, he said that you it, you still have the facade of a church. You have cardinals and you have bishops and you have churches. But it's really just an empty shell because there's a, there's a, such a complete loss of faith. His actually his primary theme was that we're living through um, what could be called the great apostasy. I agree. And so really, when one views the modern church, um, it's in a way it's just an empty shell. There's nothing really there. It's it's what he called a facade. Yeah, the counterfeit church and and prophecy. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, for those listening the first time, prophecy supports what we say. Again, we don't use that as a uh, predominant argument, but when you look back and you look at the mystics such as Blessed Anna Emmerich, who warned of this new heterodox church of Rome, this is what she was talking about, Vatican II, new church. Now, what's going to give away, and this is where I argue against the state of Acontis, who try to say that the apostate, the, the actual formal apostate church is now, well, no, that's actually going to take place when this false prophet shows up and he kicks in, he kicks out the, the seven sacraments and replaces it with this five-step self-realization program, one of which I covered in a recent talk, Bernard, is what the church fathers warned of called the mark of the beast, which is that Luciferian initiation, a counterfeit baptism that Saint, I believe it was Saint Hildegard spoke of so intimately. So the RFID chip is actually an, an, a really an afterthought to the actual initiation into the formal New Age religion. And from what I gathered, that's what I was getting out of Father Malachi Martin, is that he saw this was that close. Like it wasn't 50 years away. Like you said, he was, they were more pressed on time, these agents as Lucifer. And it seems like 2017 could be a key date with Fatima. Would, that, would you agree with that? Well, I did uh, recently have an interview with uh, Bishop uh, Richard uh, Williamson, where he said that the bad guys, the bad guys are in a hurry, and that is something that's a common theme to observers of the of the, uh, um, of the situation. It is that these uh, modernists or architects of the New World Order, for some reason. Um, are in a very tight timeline. You know how they were pushing, pushing, pushing so strong for the, the uh, uh, European Union to be put together and, and individual uh, nation states there are being to erase them from uh, any meaningful importance. That that's that's a key factor. Is that um, that the bad guys are in a hurry? Now, okay, Martin saw that at that time. Bishop Williamson sees it today. And uh, so there, there is a destination, and, uh, but they haven't totally revealed this to us at this time. Yeah, it's not revealed. Like I said, that's going to be, it's going to be, bam, right in our face, uh, probably right around World War III, if not shortly there and after. Uh, you know, but what's your take on Francis? We're getting these, these questions coming across here. You know, the last few years... He kind of is making it so obvious to people how the church is in a crisis. Maybe whereas the the more quote unquote conservative types were a little bit more concealed, they were probably even a little bit more dangerous. We would argue, like the Benedict the Sixteenth and, and the John Paul II. From our perspective, they were modernists, they were universalists. But with Francis, it's almost so clownish that it's you know your everyday Catholic can't hardly miss it. I had one lady the other day on the phone tell me. You know, her, her elderly dad in his 80s, who was just an you know, ardent papalist, he would never say anything against the Pope come out and said, he's just an, out, an outright clown. <laughs> She's like, that surprised me. So what do we make of Francis and kissing the feet of Muslims? The latest this, this past week, uh, Bernard, of course, was the whole Mother Earth push. 
And people are trying to use quotes from St. Fran Francis. We know how the modernists pervert St. Francis and false ecumenism. Now they're pushing the whole hidden paganistic agenda, which is coming, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. The New Age religion, as Father Martin pointed out, I'll let Bernard talk on this, is going to be highly paganistic. Well, it, it, I think it already uh, is paganistic because we, we have um, worship of uh, Mother Earth and environmentalism and, and uh, that kind of thing already uh, within the church. There are people that uh, worship uh, Goddess Gaia and so forth. Um, now, I think, though, getting back to your uh, question about a take on... Uh, Pope Francis, Malachi Martin, did speak of what could happen if we did elect um, a... Uh, I did ask a question, what would happen if we did elect a modernist pope? And he said the situation would then be very dire. He didn't really say um, how it would actually play out, but it would be a very, very serious situation. And I think this is what's going to come about from... Uh, Pope Francis, that in the end, what will happen is people will lose complete faith in the institution of the papacy. They will lose uh, complete faith um, in the Catholic in the Catholic Church, and then as well, you're going to see sort of a a disillusion because faith in institutions. Uh, will have been lost from all this clownish behavior of Pope Francis. Like, in the past, popes have been very tightly scripted is what they do and what they don't do because they um, realized that they want to maintain people's faith in the institutions. And now I think what's going to happen uh, with Pope Francis is all this is, is going to be lost. So in other words, he may be an important part of the process, it's a way of sweeping away the old to it so as to be able to bring in the new. It's like in Dr. Shivago, you have to uh, sweep the old stuff away before yeah. you can bring in the new. Yeah, so I... Pope Francis is an important part of this process. Now, don't forget, the moderns are also, or the bad guys, are very good at dropping certain um, leaders as hot potatoes once their role has been fulfilled. I think you could say this is true of, um, let's say, President, uh, the, the second uh, President Bush, he went in the Middle East and did the damage that he did. Sure. Well, then, like, uh, the uh, political establishment then dropped him as... Uh, a hot potato, and now he has sort of a bad name in history. Yeah, I, I think they're quite capable of doing that in the religious sphere as well. They will use um, Pope Francis for a time, but when his when his use is over, they will drop him like a hot potato. Yeah, what I found interesting too is I've been warning that Francis would just step to the side, so to speak, just quote unquote resign for years now because there was that propaganda right when he got in the uh, quote unquote office. Uh, that, you know, he might step aside. Then there was inside information, both from Leo Lagami and then from, from some others. It was relayed by certain cardinals that, yeah, he had planned on resigning this summer, quote-unquote resigning, and bailing out in Argentina, due, you know, for whatever reason. So I've, I've said pay attention to, you know, propaganda about his health, this or that. But there's no question that the New Age and their own literature say they own Francis. They're his. He's a puppet. And when they decide to move him off to the side, and you think Francis is bad now, wait till you see what shows up. Because this is where you're going to get a situation where, as Bernard was mentioning and Father Martin so warned of, it's going to see, like, people are going to ask, where is the faith? Where is the church? Because you're going to have this false prophet puppet sitting there who's going to unite all religions. And people are going to say, you know, where where's the church? What do we do? And that that was... One of the things I noticed about Father Martin is he was always trying to encourage people, kind of like what we're doing here. Is this this is you know a punishment, but we're going to get through this. Well, also Malachi Martin believed that um, what the architects of the New World Order uh, want to do is to construct a 
uh, humanitarian church. Sure. It, it's going to be totally empty of, of the supernatural. We were talking about, let's say, oh, Francis is going to resign. Well, I don't think we'll know exactly when he's going to resign because he's a very unpredictable character. Sure. But uh, the idea is to reduce the papacy to kind of an earthly institution. The idea is to reduce the priesthood to be a, like purely a uh, human institution. And so if, if the Pope uh, is one who resigns, like a chairman of the board or a company president, you've diminished the office of the papacy, you've diminished the church. And that is, that is the goal. Is to is to change the church to be and Malachi Martin spoke of this often a totally this worldly institution. Yeah, we've been warning about that here at Trad Cat Night. We have to remember the philosophy behind uh, the Second Vatican Council was, is what's called the new or integral humanism. You take a step back from that, and you see how contradictory it is towards Thomism, which is fundamentally taught. Uh, by the Catholic Church, and it's instituted all these Freemasonic principles, whether it's uh, the heresy of ecumenism, whether it's liberty of conscience, whether it's freedom of religion, this or that. But the next step on that ladder going downward into this apostate church is secular humanism, exactly what Bernard just mentioned, a church void of the dogma of faith, which was warned about at La Salette. Remember, Our Lady said... Uh, Help me out, Bernard. Um, you know, the, the Rome will become the seat of the Antichrist. Rome will lose the faith in... The seat of the Antichrist, yes. Yeah, yeah, so for me specifically, what she's warning about is the dogma of faith. This is when they'll unite all religions as one. Dogma of faith is lost there in Rome, and people are going to go... Even the people in the know sort are going to scratch their heads and be like, oh, those crazy traditionalists, they were right all along. But we're there already because... Uh... I don't know if you saw this particular video that was uh, put out by uh, the Vatican around the beginning of uh, this year, I think January, February of uh, uh, 2016, but it, the Pope's message, which was relayed on this video, had the, 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 there was a representative of the Jewish religion, oh, yeah. the Buddhist religion, the Muslim religion, the Christian religion, and they're all kind of put on par. So. Um, the apostasy is not something that we're talking about for the future. It's already here. If if these people are putting out those kinds of uh, uh, videos, and of course they've been holding a CC meetings uh, s since the 1980s, in effect we have a new church already. It's not something that's uh, coming about uh, later. Well, what, let me clarify, Bernard. What I meant is. Even if you read uh, Bishop, I think it was Bishop Sheen's writings, and there's also, I, you know, I have this from the New World Order's writings themselves, again, because I've said this for years. What they're actually going to do is they're going to do a formal ex cathedra. We, have, we of course, know it's going to be invalid, but it's going to be done by this puppet, imposter, false prophet, where he's going to try to form a, formally unite religions. Now, we know since Vatican II, it's, it, it doesn't come by way of the solemn magisterium, so everything's just kind of implied. So that's where I kind of make the distinction between the apostasy and the great apostasy. The great apostasy comes with this false prophet character who will formally, via an invalid ex cathedra, unite all religions, you know, and he'll have the UN support and all this stuff. It'll be an actual formal thing, I guess, if you will. But I understand what you're saying. I mean, we're already knee deep in modernism and in the apostasy. It's just going to be formalized right in front of our face where they say, you have to be a part of this in order to be in the new, the new age Otherwise, it seems like they're going to come for us. And that's that's kind of the... Well, at some point, they'll formalize it. But you see, I, I think they will to, even even today, they kind of have to uh, take some account of uh, the Catholic and the pew that's paying the bills. Um, sure. The European Union is not actually erasing the borders, let's say, between Germany and France. But they're rendering them meaningless because all the decisions are being made by uh, Brussels, um, and these nation states they still will exist on paper, but they won't really mean anything. Just like it'll be the difference between Germany and France in this new 
EU will be something like the difference between Nebraska and Kansas in the United States. And that's what I think you're going to have in the church, that you may not, at least until the very end stage, erase uh, the boundaries between the various churches. The various churches will still exist, but they'll be rendered meaningless because they will all have the same faith, and basically they'll all believe in nothing, really, because it'll all be, like as Malachi Martin said, a religion of man, a humanitarian church. Yeah. Yeah, and he very much spoke of, I, I believe, you know, um, the Earth Charter, uh, Gorbachev a little bit during his time. And now we're seeing, what, Agenda 21 and, and Agenda 2030 and all this environmentalism coming from Francis. And, and people don't see this. They, they, don't understand, they don't understand that, you know, they're being pushed into this humanitarianist religion. I mean, they're already in it, but again, it, I, I, you know, it's very difficult to understand how people don't see this because all of these... Well, Today we are we are seeing the fulfillment of what Malachi Martin had prophesied. Pope Francis is exactly the kind of pope that um, Malachi Martin would have foreseen, let's say in the 1990s, because he's, he's a completely this worldly pope. He's totally focused on these uh, issues like environmentalism and helping the poor. Not that uh, helping the poor is bad, but that, that sign of kind of that spiritual element of helping the poor for Francis is not there. Yeah, I agree with you. It's just it's just a front when you study socialism. And again, you could, you could go to the New Age website, shareinternational.org. And what's frightening is the same language of the social justice program of Vatican II is taught by Maitreya. So that's that's one of the direct connections that I made that he is the next step in this process. I mean, this he is going to be promoted by the UN and by Israel as the quote unquote savior of the world. Uh, and he has this term called sharing. So I warned a year ago, pay attention coming out of the Vatican and Francis' mouth over this term sharing. And guess what's been happening the past year? It's been coming out of his mouth. Uh, the legitimate, quote unquote, legitimate redistribution of wealth. And then also sharing. Everyone needs to share. So yeah, poverty is all just a front for these socialists to get their... The, these uh, socialists, the, the, the sort of, there sort of is a half truth to this. Because if you read the lives of the saints... They, they were all for. They all were had a, an active role in helping the poor. Sure. But the thing is, now helping the poor is being used to advance, like a socialist agenda, in, which is erasing the church's uh, traditional teaching that there has to be a checks and balances. That's so, so the institution of private property is very important. Governments have to be limited. That's very important. But. That aspect of it, the church, church's emphasis on checks and balances, has been completely erased. Yeah, as Father Martin warned, the new, you know the new tower, tower of Babel is being constructed, and uh, what's interesting to see is when you read prophecy. We just, I just redid the piece on Saint Francis of Assisi when, when he says this: the schism happens. And then also it was uh, Sister Jeanne of the Nativities in the 1700s says the greatest schism in which we're on the verge of. Um, it, it's foretold that two thirds are actually going to go in the bad direction. So we're going to be in the vast minority, of course. And this is where you get back to the er early testimony of the church fathers, which taught that the church would basically become invisible again, which is, you know, one of the things I correlated to what Father Martin was saying about the underground church, because I think many of us would argue we're essentially there already, but it's, it's going to get even far worse if you could believe that. Um, just, I mean, he was a prophet for our times, was he not? I mean, he he really unmasked a lot of this. Well, I do believe that Malachi Martin was a prophet uh, for our times. And this is what he had to say, though, on uh, the New World Order that's being constructed, that it will not have God's blessing because God is not included in it. And so we can expect that there will be lots of uh, wars and persecution, persecutions and don't be surprised then if uh, the kind of events that happened, let's say, in, in Paris or Brussels recently uh, in Europe are, are magnified many times over. The financial crisis that we've had in, in Greece will be magnified many times over because this new world order, as Malachi Martin said, will not have God's blessing. And in the end, it will, it will not work and it will perish. 
Yeah, and 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 reiterating what what Father Martin said in the end, my you know my immaculate heart will triumph. Our Lady's going to squash that head of the serpent, and uh, through, it's going to be through her protection. We got to keep praying that rosary, staying under her her mantle. I kind of use an analogy of of being an eagle for those who are listening for the first time. You know, an eagle is the only eagle that during a great storm will fly right through the storm, and not only fly right through the storm, fly above the storm. All the other birds will will run away in self love and fear, and they'll go cower off into the mountains. Well, we're going to have to tackle this problem head on. And I'm sure if Father, Father Martin were alive today, he, he was of that same disposition and, and mindset. And it was very militant, correct? Wouldn't you agree that? I mean, he was, I mean, he, he was Catholic action in action. I mean, he was out there doing interviews, but I mean, he was bold in a lot of the things he said. Yes. And he, he did believe that in time, Our Lady would come. He said, it sounds fantastic, but in, in, in time, she will come. But it'll have to be when sort of when mankind is ready for it. And pe- people are too attached, in my opinion, to their comforts now. And so things are going to have to get a lot worse. It'll be like between then and now, uh, we have a, a long and winding road to traverse. Yeah, and he touched upon that topic a lot, too, with, with suffering. And again, that's not to knock any of the charismatics, but that's one of the kind of different dispositions you see in the conciliar church is a lot of people don't want to embrace their cross. They don't want that suffering, which helps transform your soul. And, and it literally is leading you to heaven. That's, that's the path. There is no other way outside of the cross. And you see the conciliar church moving away from that. And that's what's interesting with the New Age teachings. That's what they preach is the self. And what did our Lord say to do? He said to deny the self. And they preach the self. It's literally the antithesis of, of what our Lord taught. And that's another interesting Piece that Father well, that's Martin. one reason why Malachi Martin believed that uh, the Vatican II religion is a, is a hollow or a dummy religion, because without the cross, you don't have Christianity. But what do they do in the modern churches? They, they've taken down uh, the crucified Lord and put up the resurrected Lord. Except they, they, they want to erase any thought of like suffering and blood. That's the, like Malachi reminded. Uh, remark that this was a kind of, uh, the modernists regard that as a kind of something barbaric that belongs to another time. Yeah, I agree with you. Se- several notations here while I'm thinking about it. The New Age has plans to remove Christmas off of the calendar. And they're going to implement, once this Maitreya character shows up, it's going to be Easter year-round. And why? Because the Christ is with us. And they're, they're going to be attacking original sin here in the not-too-distant future. I mean, they're already kind of indirectly attacking it now, the modernists, but they want this whole notion of original sin to go away because it doesn't fit their self-actualization, uh, realization program, however you want to spin it. Um, you know, we're kind of finishing up here with uh, Bernard Jansen. You can visit his website, Triumph Communications. Uh, .net. Again, please get this box set from Fal- uh, Father Malachi Martin. That's who we're talking about today. Um, you know, we were talking about the internal war. We've talked about the kingdom of darkness. There's an interesting book right here, Peter in Chains. What 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 can we find in this particular book that Father Martin covered? Well, the theme of it was is is that there are many constraints on uh, the Pope's. Uh, like a field of maneuver. He, he simply um, cannot step out of the box that has been built for him. The papacy has already been reduced. Uh, the Pope has already been reduced to being a functionary. Yeah. And I think what happened to Pope Benedict is that when he tried to step out a bit of that box, he did... He did uh, uh, introduce a motu proprio on the traditional mass. He did lift the excommunications of the four bishops of the Society of St. Pius X. But when he tried to recognize the Society of St. Pius X, that was going too far. And it was just after, shortly after that that um, he was uh, maneuvered into resigning. So you, you think now very concretely, and, and by the way, I agree with you, that the the angle on the quote unquote traditionalist or society has changed now. Now they're just saying, don't even worry about Vatican II. We'll fit you into the construct of the conciliar church. And so you, you think that's deceptive on the part of Francis to getting traditionalists under the umbrella of the, the, the counterfeit church? Well, um, 
Pope Benedict was not entirely um, an angel either. Oh, yeah, he had sure. an agenda. It was to introduce a reform of the reform. For that to be successful, you'd have to get the main body of traditionalists back into the, into the fold. Otherwise, uh, a reform of the reform would, would fizzle. Um, so he, he may not have entirely had um, all of the right intentions for bringing uh, the uh, Society of uh, St. Pius uh, X into the fold, but at least uh, Pope Benedict realized that there had to be a continuity. You could not have a complete break with the past. And what you have with Pope Francis now is a complete break with the past. And just about everything is done as almost being to mock the old religion. You don't have to breed uh, like bunnies. In other words, the words of uh, Pope Pius XII, which was that the church treasured uh, large families is not now gone by the wayside. Pope Francis goes as far as to kind of mock the old ways of doing things. And thus, I don't think we can really have anything to do with them to, and to pursue um, an agreement with modern Rome is, is what you might call a grand illusion. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm, I'm glad you see that too. And yeah, I, I'm not trying to paint Benedict the Sixteenth. Everyone knows how you know adamant we we've, we've been against him. But it, it was interesting to note. I don't know if you saw this. It was a couple months ago, uh, Bernard, where he actually came out. This came on different quote unquote conservative traditionalist website. I'll, I'll label it in that fashion, where he came out and said we are in a deep crisis. And he was kind of taking, in my my opinion, a, an indirect jab at Vatican too. So people have been asking me, you know, has Benedict converted? I mean, I have no idea. I mean, I have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. I would personally say, no, it could be another ploy. I mean, are they trying to confuse us more, break us up further? I don't know. It just seemed kind of interesting that he came out and said, well, yeah, we are in a deep crisis. Because I had personally never heard, maybe maybe you have, but I, I never heard Benedict XVI actually come out and say, yeah, we're, we're in deep doo-doo, basically. I will say this, though, and this is why we, me and Father Kramer believe B-16 is the true Pope and that he's the Pope to flee Rome. He made mention in his memoirs, essentially, of the church starting anew. So he knew that this formal New Age religion was coming. That was in his memoirs book, and I've got a picture and it's all posted. So in my opinion, he knew what the next step was. And, you know, I don't know, there's a lot of evidence there to suggest that. I think even he knows he's in for it here soon. I'll let you, you know, kind of jump off that. You can refute that if you'd like. I think um, there is always being a tension, sort of, in Pope Benedict's um, thinking. As Cardinal Ratzinger, he was had very grave reservations about the direction that the church was going. That's evident from reading the Ratzinger report. That's evident if you really uh, look at his speeches and his writings. In his thinking, though, th there was this modernist um, aspect yeah. to his philosophy. He's not a Thomist, as, let's say, Malachi Martin was a Thomist. Sure. Um, and so I think maybe um, what has uh, happened is, is that in his heart, he's maybe a traditional Catholic. Because let's say he grew up in in Bavaria in, in a in a traditional home and so forth, but um, this is a point which was made by uh, Father Peter Scott in an interview I had with him about Pope Benedict that after the Second World War in Germany as a result of the defeat of uh, uh, Hitler there was a great emphasis on freedom and that kind of carried over into the church in Germany. Uh, I know there's a book written which is called The Rhine Flows Into the Tiber, talking about how the Rhine countries, there was this, this modern uh, view of the church which took over at, at, uh, Vatican, at, at Vatican II. And so I really think that with Pope Benedict and before that when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, there, there was sort of a tension within himself. Yeah. between tradition and the modern way of thinking. And he, he was trying to reconcile it. And in the end, he was not able to do so. 
And I yeah. think that Pope Benedict's um, papacy, or his pontificate, it was a failure in a sense, because he, he was trying to reconcile two things that cannot be reconciled. It's one or the other. You're either going to go this, and Malachi Martin saw it, you either have to endorse the traditional faith or um, modernism. You cannot make a, a continuity out of them. Yeah, just as Bishop Williams has said, I mean, you, you can't mix oil and water. You can't mix these two religions together. It's an impossibility. We'll just have to keep praying for, you know, those traditionalists. We don't want to see anyone being deceived by modernists, uh, assuredly. Uh, but to, from my perspective, just my two cents, I think it's so late in the game that Francis is just pulling any card out to get the SSPX into the actual construct so they can now weave weave more into the to the network if you if you if you can say but i think we're that late in the game I, you know it's very possible that he could bail out here in the, in the next few months even let alone the next year so i know you got to get going bernard wow can you believe we just f basically finished two hours here with bernard jansen uh certainly knew father malachi martin well we hope to have uh, Bernard on again in the future, hopefully over the next few months or so, so we can talk maybe Bishop Williamson. Maybe we'll talk off to the side and, and, and see what other directions we can go in terms of putting together a program for you. But we, we need people like Mr. Jansen to, to continue to do shows like this because, again, so many feel alienated. And we need to hear the insights and the analysis, uh, not only from Father Martin, but from Bernard himself. Now, I'll, I'll give you the last few words here, Bernard. Anything you want to you know, sum up with Father Malachi Martin, websites, books, throw it all out there, and I'll, I'll wrap this program up, and I look forward to, you know, our next show. Well, I, I think it's very key to uh, read the works of Malachi Martin, listen to his uh, recordings, because I think in time he'll be regarded as uh, a very historic figure in this post-Vatican II period, because... He was one of the lights that saw uh, modernism in the church for what for what it was, and I, I think that in time um, he'll be regarded as a prophet. I think that that uh, he will be seen in a different light than what uh, what he is has been today, because there have been a lot of uh, criticisms of him, but his view is going to become more and more apparent as the church goes further and further into the night that it's falling. And I wish to say thank you very much for uh, bringing me onto your show and making it possible to present um, kind of the world view and church view of a man who I think is going to be a uh, regarded as a great historic figure. Very well said, Bernard. And again, I, I appreciate you taking the time out uh, and, and giving us the knowledge and giving us some more insights from Father Malachi Martin. Father Mar Malachi Martin was instrumental in helping me clear up a lot of questions that I had. So it wasn't just Archbishop Lefebvre. It wasn't just Father Hess, Father Kramer. It was certainly Father Malachi Martin with all the inside information that he had uh you know, and all the encouragement too, really, in all this. I mean, let's put aside the apocalyptic nature, the apostasy. I mean, he, he truly did uh, encourage me, at least I was encouraged, to get out there and practice my faith, uh, devotions, be, be strong in your faith, don't, you know, whimper or cower away from the modernists. And uh, again, what can I say? Hopefully next time we'll have uh, Bernard on and we'll cover maybe Bishop Williamson. And some more of the, the current topics. Again, Bernard and I could talk for on Father Martin probably for five or six hours, but we don't have that, that kind of time. And so uh, until next time, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you get to Bernard's website, triumphcommunications.net. You can uh, give a call, 306-567-3336 for uh, the recordings, the books. Uh, the videos, a lot going on on his uh, website and his apostle. Make sure you support him, and uh, we're going to have him on again here in the not-too-distant future. Till next time, ladies and gentlemen, wear your scapular, pray the rosary, stay close to the Immaculate Heart. The Immaculate Heart leads to the Sacred Heart. Be as an eagle, stay hidden in that great tree, and let the rays of justice uh, bounce off of the tree. Till next time, stay safe, and God bless.